Hi, my name is Camila, and welcome to the next episode of Humans of AI, where together with my guests from business and academia, we try to demystify what AI is and what it's not, hopefully making this whole concept a bit more digestible. Today, we are welcoming Elena Poggia, the founder of Data Economics and Data Natives. Uh, Elena is a creative and practical, uh, purpose-driven professional with an entrepreneurial mindset. She has an in incredibly diverse experience working in art, uh, tech and business. That makes her one of the very few people with the most interesting, interesting perspective on what it means to be human in a data age. Hi, Elena. Hi. Thank you for having me. How did it happen that from graduating in literature and modern and contemporary art, uh, you went into tech technology and you founded a data economy magazine and then you created this amazing uh, data na natives um, conference. How this transition happened? Yes. So the, yeah, I would say like the, the interesting journeys, like, you know, we always, we always imagine that uh, the journey when it comes to our lives would start and be very linear and that we will go to university, we will graduate with a degree, and then that will be the work that we will do for the rest of our lives. At least that was the boomers generation hypothesis. Mm -hmm. uh, for me, I actually have done a lot of different things. So I started, at first I started business, which is the irony of things because now I am an entrepreneur. Um, but I wanted something more for my personal development. So I wanted to do something that would really be fulfilling for me um, as a person. So that's why I decided to do art history first. Um, I did a short course in London and then I moved to do um, a master's of modern and contemporary art. It was, it was great to see the world through these lenses because mm -hmm. when it comes to art, art and history, I think that gives you a very good perspective of how culture, how civilization evolved, how human and society are. So it's quite humanitarian, right? And um, it also gave me very good tools of how to communicate, how to write. Um, and I do, I, I think I did get a, a very good understanding of, um, a, yeah, of, of, even psychology and marketing insights of how to actually, you know, how, how to position ourselves. Mm -hmm. um, and the funny thing is the way I got into tech, mm -hmm. I mean, I've always been, I would say since a kid, you know, I mean, we grew up with technology. I've always been very curious about technology and yeah. very curious about, you know, social media. Um, I was like, after, after school, I would always come home and play with, uh, you know, with, with uh, my computer, like discovering mm -hmm. the world through Internet Explorer at the time, like mm -hmm. the really familiar sound of the, of the internet connecting, you know, oh, yeah. those days. Those <laughs> days. <laughs> yeah. um, so uh, I was always very curious. So when, when after my studies in, in art, in art history and modern and contemporary art, I returned to Greece, Mm -hmm. where I, I got involved in a lot of digital art initiatives. Okay. So uh, that's why I um, started my first, co-founded with some other people, my first um, company uh, mm -hmm. to execute an in digital art festival and new digital art and music festival. Mm -hmm. I was really interested in, in digital art. Um, and basically what I really, what I really liked about digital art was a, the way that, you know, how it was made. So yeah. mainly it was done by developers and design, graphic designers, and also the commentary on society that it, 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 it mm -hmm. made. Mm -hmm. So for example, like I think now a very big topic when it comes to AI, it's data ethics. Mm -hmm. So back then there were a lot of artists that I was uh, working with or that I was um, following their progress that had to do a lot with what's happening to our data, how is data collected, mm -hmm. the ethics around it, how, you know, all of these topics that now are actually uh, mainstream or becoming mainstream according yeah. to my, according to me, like basically data commod commodification, data monetization, um, analyt, predictive analytics, like now in a lot of industries that is became, becoming the norm. Mm -hmm. So back then for me, it was more like a philosophical and existential quest um, that slowly turned into what now is the economy, the natives. Mm -hmm. The economy is the media platform where 
um, as, the, the, as the name suggests, we talk around how data science is shaping our economy and connecting those two dots. Mm -hmm. um, and data natives is really for the millennial and Gen Z generation. How are these people connecting? How are they interacting? How are they communicating? And what does that mean around it? So mm -hmm. this, this is how these two things came about. And I would say it's like um, my, for my general fascination with technology and society and how much impact it has mm -hmm. on us human beings. Right. Sounds like an amazing journey. And uh, I know that you also had your um, take on fighting, in a way, uh, COVID. <laughs> you, you've done a hack corona. I saw that uh, you gathered 1,700 uh, hackers. And, and it was beginning of the outbreak in March. Like, how did you go about it? Like, no one knew what, what, what's happening. And, and it was a completely new situation. Uh, what have you uh, produced with, with uh, like during this uh, hackathon? So indeed, um, as you as you understand already from as a pattern from my for the things that I like to do is that I, I really like you just jump be, into deep water. Exactly. <laughs> jump into things, but also um, really following. I would say what's happening, you know. So like mm -hmm. really going with the current vibration of like the universe to put it romantically yeah. but um but basically yeah so so with ha corona it was just the weekend before the lockdown oh. when uh, or in germany before we had to start working from home mm -hmm. when you know we were thinking i think from our sides and for me at least it was very fulfilling to to know that i'm somehow um doing something mm -hmm. to to find a solution because i think otherwise i would have I mean, I did it for my own sanity. I think yeah. otherwise I would have been depressed. Um, and I know there's like, I've seen it from my friends as well. There were two, two separate groups that they evolved, basically the ones that they just focused on themselves. So self-care, you know, yes. doing like everyday yoga routines yeah, yeah. or really minded yeah, diet. <laughs> exactly. And then there are people like me who instead, like we just, I just dwelled into the cause. So the mm -hmm. cause for me was very important. So yeah, so essentially what happened was we gathered in the office, actually one of our youngest team members, um, you know, she was sharing um, how, how, like, what can we do? How can we help the elderly? How can we help, you know, I, I have a couple of friends also who started like doing other projects, like the open source uh, child project was one of them here in Berlin from a friend who um, did, uh, who, who has a foundation called Hippo AI. Mm -hmm. um, we also work together very closely with um a company that focused on data protection and privacy for for citizens uh poly, poly that they also started their a foundation or they were mm -hmm. one of the founding partners of both end which also was around uh, privacy and in, in healthcare mm -hmm. at the beginning at least um and other similar initiatives the open open source um uh, medical devices and mm -hmm. we basically saw around us that there were a lot of things like that you know coming coming to life mm -hmm. and we thought how can we contribute so our contribution to this was to start the Hakurona initiative mm -hmm. so the Hakurona was actually only the beginning because we started it ourselves um actually together with another partner um who also did a lot of hackathons Elan Minzer from from Israel um we started this Hakurona series here um in Berlin mm -hmm. and we worked with a lot of other affiliations like Hacking Health which is a uh, uh, international non-profit organization, Bayer, um, who supported us in this, Charité. So we did a couple of editions uh, as Data Natives Hakurona. Mm -hmm. And then um, we, and then, so one initiative was here in Berlin with Bayer and Hacking Health. The other one was with, uh, with the, with the Greece versus Virus, which is a, an initiative from the so for Greece, ministries of Greece. Mm -hmm. So we also looked at it from that angle. Um, and also we did uh, the we did a collaboration the Easter hack with Hacking Health and Charité, and mm -hmm. then actually we um, we embarked on an even bigger journey with the EU versus virus community. Mm -hmm. So um, the EU versus virus community was initiated by the European Commission at the end of April, mm -hmm. um, around that time, um, and then we we did a huge hackathon, probably the biggest one that you can imagine. It was. I mean, it was 25,000 participants, of that, but that's not what makes it the biggest. It's mm -hmm. the fact that we had 2,000 projects that were submitted. Oh, wow. And those 2,000 projects, we selected, well, a jury, um, the jury members selected about 120 
Mm -hmm. And those 120 then continued to what we call the matchathon, which is a completely new format mm -hmm. where you could connect the participants, the, the winners with partners together to work together. And now all of these 120, to, uh, 120 projects together with the partners and more partners have moved to the European Innovation Council. Mm -hmm. So just to like cut a long story short, you asked me essentially what has happened afterwards, what happened with the okay. solution, right? <laughs> back to your original question so from all of these initiatives i would say taking it backwards the eu versus virus one the 120 solutions are now in the european innovation council mm -hmm. and they uh, receive mentorship and they receive coaching and business services which is really a unique opportunity for them mm -hmm. um and some of those and some of those solutions you know they are they are focused on the COVID-19 specifically, but some of them are actually tackling the crisis overall. Mm -hmm. um, so there's, uh, there's one called Break Even from Sweden, uh, one solution that they just started as a company now, which is specifically focused on helping. Um, <clears throat> okay, I think I'm gonna, I think it's annoys me. So let me just close. Okay, no worries. I don't hear it, but go on. Okay, I talk a lot, clearly. <laughs> That's <I'll okay>. <laughs> so what I was saying is like, from these 120 solutions, uh, break even one of them was from Sweden. Mm -hmm. They started actually as a project that spinned off and now they made a company. And what they're trying to do is helping companies break even and not close. Okay. So it specifically, it specifically helps companies that they are struggling at the moment to raise the funds, either by crowdfunding or by supporting, you know, by local communities, which is great, right? Mm -hmm. And this is more for saving the economy. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, there's other, there were other solutions, that's just one example from the 120, there were other solutions that they were tackling the issue, not necessarily only from the perspective of the, you know, COVID-19, but also the economy of work of, you know, there were six domains. Mm -hmm. And that's from EU versus virus. Then if you look at uh, what we did in Greece, for example, we just recently had an award ceremony because, MSD, the big pharmaceutical company, mm -hmm. um, it, the, the, the branch in Greece, um, partnered up with the Ministry of Health they, in Greece. They found a really useful solution, mm -hmm. which uh, was what that came out of Hakorona called Assistant Volunteer, mm -hmm. uh, which helps managing the volunteers for COVID-19. So the Ministry of Health in Greece, they had a big call for volunteers. They gathered 10,000 volunteers. And now with this solution, and with the support of MSD. So really a really good example of the private sector coming together with the public sector mm -hmm. to boost, you know, to, to help um, overcome this in civic society, these difficulties. Yeah. And from our side, from, uh, from Ha Corona here in Berlin, um, there's also a lot of projects. I mean, actually one of them that was, that was a winner, the EU versus virus, uh, uh, XT Bio E, they uh, came also at the Hakorona um, event, uh, mm -hmm. the first one that we did, and basically now have, have gone from hackathon to hackathon, and now they, they have opportunities to help. They specifically help with vaccines, um, and, and they, they will potentially might play a role in finding a solution out of this whole crisis. Um, so there's, there's a lot of, I mean, I would say there's, there's a lot of interconnectedness with all of mm -hmm. these hackathons, and for sure, from my side, it really is helpful to, um, to really make a difference mm -hmm. in some way and at some capacity yeah. to what has been going on. Yeah, I think like the, the, the most beneficial um, part of what you are creating is, is giving the normal, let's say, citizens uh, connection with, with, with the government or with the like, bigger entities which can take it further and, and and amazing like you've done this in amazingly short time usually it takes ages to even start talking <laughs> but yeah well done well done uh so how how do you think the whole pandemic pandemia uh changed the perception of of people's identity and like how yeah like how people uh see themselves and obviously there are so many um, aspects of feeling alienated like what do you think um, being in data <laughs> maybe you can support it with, with what you've seen <clears throat> so I think um, a lot of people have been calling this the new normal mm -hmm. um, 
and I think like uh, yeah, for for me for sure, um, what has happened is that it has definitely connected us more with with ourselves up to an extent. Mm-hmm. It has created like it was an enforced slowness in mm-hmm. a way, you know, mm-hmm. slowness of 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 you know how I mean we used to travel so much. We used to um, we used to be out so much. Um, uh, I don't know, like, the, I think like everything was moving so fast that we didn't really take a time to really um, appreciate, exactly. Yeah, exactly, appreciate and really like introspection of what was going on. Mm-hmm. So I think on one hand, it really connected us to ourselves, but then it's something also that I was noticing. And I guess maybe for me, um, from my side, always considering myself a data native, um, it was totally normal, but I see people now, like it forced a digital transformation for people. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. It basically now it changed, and that's why it's called the new normal. It changed how we perceive the world and how we do things. Now, for example, remote work is totally acceptable. Yeah, no yeah. one considers it a hurdle or difficult. Mm-hmm. So everybody can work from anywhere, and they know that. I mean, the professions that they can do that. Of course, yeah. there's some professions that you cannot do that, but. For professions that mainly you use your laptop now, it's completely normal not to be at the office. And I think that will bring a new normalcy there. Mm-hmm. Um, in terms of like uh, how we use technology and all the things that we can do with technology, I think there's another, another level of understanding mm-hmm. um, of how to utilize technology. It yeah. really has created like nor- normalcy when it comes to remote intimacy, right? Mm-hmm. So I used to make phone calls with, you know, without camera. And now it's like, I want to take yes. with the camera on. It's as if I'm oh, even having yeah. like small, like, um, yeah, small um, one-on-ones with people and friends. So mm-hmm. completely normalizing that aspect. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I think, I think that's also something that makes a big difference in how we are communicating. Um, also with business transactions. I think like, basically, I live in Berlin and Berlin was not accepting credit card payments until basically COVID. Yes. And there's a, meme, there's a meme that makes a joke about it because, you know, like, what has made, what has brought digital information to your company? Uh, uh, the COVID-19, yes. It's COVID-19, yeah. <laughs> it is COVID-19. Oh, it has, like, uh, it has, in a way, you know, there's always some positives out of this. So, mm-hmm. really, mm-hmm. it has, it will change a lot of things um, permanently. And for sure, when it comes, even when it comes to what you said about governments, um, mm-hmm. now I think there's like a sense of agility. There's a sense of let's make things, um, uh, let, let's, let's react faster to things. Yeah. Let's, let's take other solutions. Let's, let's um, transform faster. Let's change our ways and the way that we do things faster mm-hmm. so that we can accommodate um, civic society. Um, so I think, I think like it would affect, it, it is affecting in all levels. Um, mm-hmm. and those are just some examples of how it's affecting and, um, and how it makes, yeah, it makes our life different and yeah. it will continue making our life different. Yeah, yeah. you complete, I completely agree. Uh, like you said, it, it kind of forced lots of companies, um, to, <laughs> to push for digital transformation, the, the real one. Uh, I spoke with many, uh, like se- when I speak with many senior uh, leaders, many of them are telling me pre-corona, pre-pandemia, uh, they always thought of those people who wanted to work remotely as slackers. And right now they realize that actually the, uh, you know, the productivity didn't even, didn't drop or even uh, got better. And they, they themselves are saving so much time. So they are now they they now became the advocates of 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 working remotely so so many things happened which are in a way good <laughs> if you can say that Thank so you. <laughs> so i know that one uh, like another area which you are very vocal about is um, the right communication of technical uh information to non techies and as a non-techie yourself, um, you are often sharing advice how to do it, so both groups um, understand each other. Uh, so how, how do you, like, what's your advice and how, how do you um, help others to, to communicate properly, to be understood? Hmm. So that's a good question. So I guess um, 
I suppose this, there's three aspects of, to it. Mm-hmm. One is about, as you mentioned, because I'm a non-techie, I, want, I also want the information comprehen- like, that to be made comprehensible for me. Because mm-hmm. um, I think that um, a lot of the times, you know, you notice also with a lot of software, software as a service companies that basically they develop the solution to that point where if not, you're not part of the industry, then you don't really understand mm-hmm. um, what's going on. And I think, um, I think on that note, something also related with COVID-19 and how society is changing is that because so far it was okay because um, this then became a B2B, uh, so it's a B2B relationship. So those software as a service companies, they would try to attract other businesses who would understand and get pretty much like the level of detail or the level of complexity of the solution. But I think now what's happening also in the world, because we are working remotely, because business is changing, because of this transformation, Mm -hmm. it's no longer B2B, it's B2C. So you also want the individual to understand your technology. Mm-hmm. Or to understand what you know what they're working on. It's I guess like what Apple did with the personalized computer, right? This is like one example of B two B two C. So it used to be that computers were all in the office, but now mm-hmm. everybody's using a computer. Yeah, yeah. So just just one example. So I guess this very it becomes increasingly important that non technical people, so people who don't necessarily work on the back end, can comprehend the front end. Mm-hmm. And I think it's because and I think it's it's related with. With this one, for me, it's this aspect that it's a bit to see world now. The other thing is that it's related with how can you communicate so that it's not only about the how, but it's also about the why, mm-hmm. the why the technology exists and how, why does it make my life different and it's helpful. Um, and also because, I mean, also from my, from, from my background on what I do, basically data natives is a community of techies and non-techies and mm-hmm. for the tech is important to understand what tools to use mm-hmm. if they don't know and they haven't used it, but also for the non tech is. And a lot of these technologies are becoming more mainstream and more utilized in a, in a wider spread. So it, it should be like for non coders or non data scientists to be able to at least understand the, either the business value or the societal value mm-hmm. or, you know, to, to be able to have different layers. Of course, like in some cases, you do need the very, very technical, but when it comes to communicating mm-hmm. to the wider world, it should be easily comprehended. So um, I suppose that th- those are the reasons why I, um, yeah, why I, dis- I thought that this is very important. Mm-hmm. And of course, for me, like I would need, I always need a, let's say a translator. So someone who can explain this, yeah. Or I need to do research around it so I can understand it. Mm-hmm. Um, but actually, it's not only me. It's my team mainly who's doing that because we have the, the website, which is with a lot of contributors. They're writing about it. Um, and also a big editorial team that actually takes this information and then breaks it down. Um, and yeah, I mean, it, 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 is, it is important, I think, for us to understand what we are communicating, but also for people with different expertise and different layers that would need to use technologies to understand it. Um, uh, yeah. So, so I hope I answered your question. Yes. <laughs> no, sure. And expanding on that, I think right now you see more human uh, face of many technological companies, right? Like you, people kind of let uh, others like strangers into their homes. You, you see uh, so many like per- personal almost videos uh, of representatives of some big corporations, you 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 never kind of felt um, connected to them, other than what the media or like the personal perfectly tailored PR was giving you. Right now, you see humans, you you see people behind those brands, right? So that's exactly, a, yeah, yeah. The human the human face of AI, as you also mentioned, exactly. Um, which I think it's also the AI has been uh, demonized. Um, well, because it's the unknown and we don't know what it is, but also because of um, how the perception of what AI would mean if it mm-hmm. comes to life um, or if we make it happen. Yeah. Um, because, I mean, we're still talking more about machine learning rather than yes. artificial intelligence. Uh, but, uh, but still, I think exactly it's important to put a human face on it and to actually um, be able to communicate it in a way that 
and connect that, yeah exactly and not be afraid of asking questions right because as you said so many things are it's a hype basically right like um you want to know what what it does and what are their limitations as well and if you see the human <laughs> behind the brand maybe you can be more um uh brave to answer uh, to uh, ask questions so yeah let's let's go in deeper into the uh, angle of ethics <laughs> in ai so why do you think talking about it is so important Yes, so actually to make a connection also with what you said before, because I mentioned for three things and the third thing I did not mention it. So the third thing I think which is important and what makes a non-techie to be able to talk about techie stuff in at least a fundamental easy level mm -hmm. is the fact that, and I will connect it also with the ethical AI, is the fact that actually when it comes to um, the level, when it comes to the structure of a team, a mm -hmm. data science team, a data engineering team, the aspect of making that team work are fundamentally um, related to the organizational structure. It's based on more like, more like um, soft skills rather than hard mm -hmm. skills. That's yeah. what makes actually a team work more. So you can, you can, in a way, relate to it because of the human aspect of it. So when we're talking about, yes, there's, in every profession, there's a specific things that are very, very... Um, they're very much related with that profession. And of course, one person needs to be specialized. But when it comes to any kind of organizational setting, it actually becomes quite, I wouldn't say universal, but quite similar. There's a lot of similar aspects to it. Um, and then that's also why it's important to talk about ethics in AI. Because when, of course, like, as in every civilization, every society, we also need to set the standards, right? Mm -hmm. And when it comes to data science or when it comes to machine learning, this, the people now working on these technologies and working on this data, they are the ones that set the standards for the future. Mm -hmm. So they need to have responsibility. The same way that a lawyer takes an oath that you know, they will do their profession at the best standards. The same way that a doctor takes an oath because they need to make sure that you know, because they have responsibility towards their patients. Mm -hmm. Similarly, a, te a, de a technical person nowadays, mm -hmm. they're, they're, they're creating the, first, the, the foundation the, of our society, of our, you know, of our software, the, the software as, as, as yeah, exactly, as our society of how we'll be in the future. Yeah. So that's why it's important not to be biased in the data, or at least to be as transparent and open as possible as to what data did you use in order to conclude to something. Mm -hmm. You need to be able to, you know, to give your references, to be able to cite, uh, to cite your, your, um, your references in your hypothetical paper that, okay, I got that data set and that's why this was the result of it. Mm -hmm. Or I, I created this automated machine to solve this problem with yeah. this solution. It has to be explainable, basically. Exactly. And I think it's important that the this discussion happens now and data scientists and technologists understand the responsibility that they have mm -hmm. um, towards, you know, towards our societies because they are the ones right now that shaping this technology moving forward. Um, mm -hmm. and, and that's why I think it's very important. So ethics as part of the conversation are right now are very crucial and, um, and they're crucial in different ways. Um, I think, for example, GDPR in Europe um, has been one of the fundamental ways to protect citizens from from the usage of their data mm -hmm. without their consent. Mm -hmm. um, I think like it's like for me it's very important that we are as open and transparent about what data we collect, how we collect it, and how mm -hmm. we use it. Mm -hmm. That we that this that the citizen is you know has their own data if they want to, and they can and they would be able to know where their data is yeah. and how it's been used. And really. On a micro level, I know it sounds silly because on a micro level, if you think about it, okay, well, they have my data but, and it's my data, you know, uh, up to an extent, it doesn't make that much difference. But if you look at it on a macro level and then they put you in a specific stereotype or they, you know, you are part of like, you're labeled in a specific way, then there's more prejudice. There's, there's like a continuation of stereotypes. There's yeah. lack of diversity, lack of inclusivity. And of course, like, it's all about like you being able to own your own data if you want mm -hmm, to. Mm -hmm. so, yeah, being, being in control. 
exactly yeah you just answered three of my next questions <laughs> not really good <laughs> like good 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 answers but not really good because i have less um but yes as you said like um it's very important to do to to take care of bias because right now we are training the uh algorithms they uh, like using the real time uh, data and the, like by nature humans are biased right so we have to make sure that we are incorporating some like the good bias right uh sometimes you want to enforce uh certain behaviors like for example um giving more like women more um visibility right to 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 let them progress with careers and that's the same thing which we have to do in a way with with um incorporating the, the good bias in a in the data do you have any like thoughts about this or have you seen any um like interesting initiatives happening around this so basically you're saying um like it's it's the same way as positive discrimination basically yes. that okay to be discriminating as long as you are somehow like fixing an imbalance in the system yes, exactly. um yeah i mean i've seen i don't know if i've seen i i know of excuse me you, you this brought to mind um a hackathon again that mm -hmm. was uh, that i was a part of last year mm -hmm. which was about diversity in uh, diversity in the in general and i think it was two years ago and it was organized by t labs or dota telecom um okay. mm -hmm. uh, or t systems one of those three they're affiliated <laughs> somehow yeah all of these guys so and there was one very interesting proposal which actually was uh, about positive discrimination mm -hmm. um essentially when it comes to receiving as i think like the most discriminatory one of the most discriminatory places is hr right so how you are prioritizing the cvs um i mean in some instances they also had photos of the person which could be really discriminatory because then you basically might be making your you're making your decision based on the person and of course it's again like unconsciously you're mm -hmm. usually hiring someone that looks like similar, you yeah. mm -hmm. that they are similar to you so you're mm -hmm. either gonna hire um I mean, and that goes that it goes in all levels, right? I mean, if you are a white, a middle class person, then you will hire a white middle class person. Yeah, yeah. If you are, um, uh, I don't know, if you if you're a woman, you will prefer a woman, and so forth and so forth. So um, this is this is the thing. So in what the solution was that putting, how about putting at the top of the CVs mm -hmm. uh, women of color. And then everybody else. So then you first look at those CVs before you reach at the bottom. Um, yeah, I mean, that's a solution, I guess. This is like a way to, to overcome the problem. I think this kind of overfixation also is trying to, it's happening with, you know, with di different legislations. I, I mean, Germany, so I know, for example, that they are aiming to increase uh, the women participation in board of directors. Mm -hmm. So they're forcing big companies to actually always have a woman. I think a specific percentage of how many women that you have in the board of directors to increase the number, right? I think by now there's only 3%, they want to reach 30%, yeah, which I think yeah. it makes, you know, it's a, it's a good move. Um, and, uh, but, but in general, I think it is this kind of over fixation that in a way we need, right? So the feminist always said about that, like in order to actually have equality, you need to have women run the world first. I don't know how much I agree with this. Um, I'm a feminist, uh, I'm a feminist, but I don't know how much I agree with this. Um, but I do see elements of, if you don't speak up, if you mm -hmm. don't like really- Opportunity. Push, yeah, push like Black Lives Matters. Mm -hmm. If you don't go to the streets and really protest and mm -hmm. turn it into um, an opportunity of everybody knowing about it, yeah. then I don't know how it will touch um, yeah. people that are unaffected by it. Yeah. And that's the thing, you, this is the problem with this kind of, um, with this kind of biases. You don't necessarily see it unless you are from the other side. Mm -hmm. So if you are in the mainstream and you've always been a dominant culture, you might not be able to see this. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. The same way that we don't see our whiteness. Um, yeah. You know, I don't, I, I, I was like, a bl I was blinded to it by mm -hmm. it until like, you know, I didn't even see the problem until mm -hmm. like repeatedly, you know, media and hearing, hearing about it. Exactly. Yeah. 
Yeah. Um, so like, and this is just one example. Um, and uh, you, you don't you don't see discrimination unless you are discriminated against. Um, mm -hmm. So yeah, I think like a level for for sure there should be that people should be more conscious about it. Mm -hmm. This is I think the world like being more conscious would would mm -hmm. change. And this is when it comes to data science and AI ethics. The consciousness needs to change, and also learning about this thing, constantly learning, constantly being informed in order to be able to bring a shift. Um, yeah. And of course. And of course, when it comes sorry, to, to no, no, go on, go on. <laughs> when it comes to the data science teams, right? How can you, uh, how can you like? It's the same thing. Like, how can someone make products for women unless mm -hmm. they have a woman in the team? Mm -hmm. How can you, for example, know what a woman would need yeah. biologically unless you have someone in the team that would actually understand that aspect? And I think that's the same thing with you know, with, with minorities and people of color and, mm -hmm. and like you can't understand the aspect unless you also diversify your own team, diversify your own data, be able to like, you know, to, to have these people included in so that you can actually be able to have an opinion on it or to, 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 to work with the data in a specific way. Yeah, that's a really, really good point. So um, you obviously, see the <laughs> in talks the the duality of of ai right like it can be good, used for so many good things but some companies can abuse it right um so what do you think or for, yeah there's this example of companies uh i think germany has different level of of uh, data privacy than some con other countries but there are some uh, software companies which allow employees to take or like give the tools uh, for employees to the employers to take screenshots of their employee uh, workstation every 30 seconds, for example. So you can see if someone is working, if someone is, you know, there. Uh, so what do you think can be done uh, maybe from like legislative uh, bit to prevent over like over abusing, uh, ab sorry, abusing the um, the power of AI or like the technology in general. Mm. That's a that's a good question. Uh, yes, you, you you got me at a point where I'm like I need some time to to think and formulate my answer. Yeah. Um, I guess this is why this, this goes back to the standards of, of, of technology usage. Mm -hmm. I guess this is why we need to, um, to create principles, right? Mm -hmm. To create like a set, of, a set of principles that would set the tone when it comes to how we use, how we use these technologies. Um, as an employer myself, I understand why for example with the example that you gave why would an employer or a boss would like to do random checks to make mm -hmm. sure that people work mm -hmm. um also in some companies for a long time they you know they they forbid the usage of uh, different social media tools like you wouldn't be able to log in yeah, facebook yeah, yeah. for example from the office um i suppose like with this stuff there should be two layers right there should be a, a the one that it should be used everywhere, um, like uh, the principles, as I say, like 10 principles of how data should be collected, how, uh, what are the foundations of ethical AI, what are the foundations of explainable AI, like how can people obtain their information, et cetera, et cetera. Mm -hmm. And then it should also be specific, mm -hmm. like company, company to company, because this kind of random checks they are checks that they're happening um, for at, at companies, right? So mm -hmm. they're checks that the company set the tone and decides on how to do. And of course, the most important thing is that there's consent, right? So that people know that this will happen. But when you are at work, I also don't think it's, um, I don't think that it's a stretch um, to, to have these random checks. Now, if that happens without your permission or it happens because your camera is on and someone is recording you, yeah. that's different. That's, that goes to a different point. But if you're at work and, you know, and this is just for your boss to make sure that you are uh, performing the tasks that you said or that, you know, 
this, this is, yeah. Ideally, there's trust to the point where things like that are not necessary. Mm-hmm. But I don't think that then, but the, I don't know, I don't think that we are at the point as humans there yet. So to ask that from AI would also be contradictory. And I think another reason why I, I think we're so afraid of AI is because, well, we are creating it, right? Mm-hmm. And as everything, it can have without humans create um or yes everything that exists can if you put it out in the open it can be misused yes and it can be also used for the good so that's why we need to create the parameters to make sure that it's used for good as much as possible but we need to be prepared for it to be misused as everything you know Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. because you know and I, I don't like this kind of duality, you know, there's like, because you also mentioned there's a duality, good or bad. And I think that's, for example, with both ends, that's the kind of, that's the kind of narrative that, um, that uh, we're trying to avoid. Um, both ends, this nonprofit organization that I mentioned before, because, you know, it's not either or, it should be both ends. Like you can actually have, you can have, it's, it's a gray area. You can have um, more than, than one options. Mm-hmm. But of course, like you should always take into consideration how human behavior or how the, you know, how people will take advantage of it. Yeah. Um, but um, that's why this kind of, that's why the, even if you see law and legislation, it always constantly updates itself because mm-hmm. it changes you know it's not a it's, just, it's not a static thing it's not like okay so now we wrote it down and it's gone no it just builds up to it based on other examples and how people use it yeah so yeah yeah it's a tricky tr- tricky thing to tackle <laughs> so um since you've been running i don't know how many years you've been running the data magazine for uh, the data economics magazine for was it um, Five years now. Yeah, okay. it's been one. Yeah. So, so it's a well done. <laughs> so it's a good question to ask. So, um, what do you observe around like other media uh, portraying the challenges of AI? Uh, do you think the the mass media is reporting um, the challenges uh, correctly, or there should be some and, and the ethics of it, uh, or there should be some like different angle uh, which is not being really mentioned? Well, we, yeah, so when it comes to data and AI, um, yeah. no worries. And the one, <laughs> My computer was Dyson. <laughs> Sorry, go on. No worries, no worries. Um, so when it comes to data and AI and data economy, it's one of the top 10 AI magazines right now in the world, according to Industry Wired, um, mm-hmm. because we, we're tackling this, though, from a very specific angle. So the data and AI topic, and as you mentioned, it has now gone to mainstream media. So Mm -hmm. Financial Times, The Economist, um, Forbes, they they are all covering also data and AI as a topic Mm -hmm. because it's no longer, uh, you know, it's no longer something that only technical people do and talk about, but it's also becoming part of the society that and how we are, how we are, um, how does it, how the society now would work. So Mm -hmm. Uh, from our side and the angle that we took was related more to the new and latest information for technical people to understand what are the trends, how is it going Mm -hmm. and what, what news they should follow. And then also at the same time for business professionals and, um, and people who work in the industry, but they're not necessarily technical to also see the benefits of it. Mm-hmm. I think like a lot of mainstream media is covering also the societal aspect that we are covering all, we're also covering through our conference. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I mean, when it comes to what other topics could they be covered? Um, yeah, I mean, uh, it's, it's such a new and um, a new topic, right? The, it's, it, and it's ever evolving yeah. that, in, that, it, that it's, it's hard to say what else should be covered. I think like when this new thing, the new, when the latest technology will come, then we will know what else should be covered. I think there's, um, there's a lot of publications out there that they're doing uh, a lot of the great work um, all on, on it, you know, mm-hmm. um, and there's a lot of content out there. Yeah. Um, what I think is important in general for media 
but that's not necessarily with the topic of data and AI. It's more in general for media. It's that I think it would become increasingly important because there's a lot of content out there mm -hmm. that things are constantly fact checked. Yes. Because uh, right now, basically, there's a lot of content that's been put out in different blogs with different credibility mm -hmm. um, that, uh, that basically is not necessarily fact-checked. And then people left and right are misinforming people. Mm -hmm. So and I've, we've seen that with fake news, with, with the rise of fake news, basically, yeah. which is, you know, the new propaganda, essentially, tool mm -hmm. with fake news in the, in the, in the previous elections. Um, and now we, you know, now we will continue seeing it with, especially with deep fakes, which is a big thing. So mm -hmm. for me, deep fakes um, is something that we need to really tackle because essentially now everyone can take your, your expressions from the internet and then basically make video about you saying things that you might have never thought of. Yeah. So this is quite scary. Um, but this is more like, I would say, my opinion when it comes to, well, what's the next step for data and AI in the media? And that would be it. More, more making sure that things are fact-checked. Yes, yes, you're right. And I saw there are so many like open source uh, projects where like people with a slight, even slight understanding of technology, they can use uh, the the algorithms and and do those things, as you said. So it's crazy how like popularized and how available it becomes. Um, okay, and let's go back to the uh, topic of consciousness we, you mentioned several times. Uh, obviously, like we don't know where this thing is going, the, the general AI, but there are some, there, there have been uh, some portraying uh, like the movies and, and uh, other um, mediums in pop popular culture uh, tried to portray the the problem of conscious uh, robotics or conscious uh, machine. I don't know if you've seen this movie uh, Ex Machina or Her. <laughs> yeah, so how, how do you think we should look at um, the consciousness <laughs> in, in <laughs> yeah, in technology? It's funny though that both of them are women <laughs> or at least female yeah. identical people yeah. um i mean we had robocop but he was not a he was no not that's a, not really <laughs> conscious <laughs> he was not as evil or conscious as ex machina or hair yeah um i think like what and i, I also i'm a big fan of black mirror Are oh, you yeah. watching? yeah so like i think i think there's like an attempt with um fiction uh science fiction with you know to portray like extreme alternative realities mm -hmm. by, by taking aspects of our lives. So for example, you mentioned hair. Well, you know, I think like we, li we all lived the, the scenario that is portrayed at, in hair uh, yeah. during the lockdown, because basically we only had our computer to talk to, <laughs> or at least like most of us. Yeah. Um, so we spent a lot of time talking to people through this. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, it's questioning reality essentially. Mm -hmm. um, I think it's hard to grasp consciousness um, when when it's so hard to understand your own consciousness as a human, right? right? So it's so difficult. Like we always, I think, I think what I think what manifests with this type of sci-fi movies in popular culture, TV, and um, and in in in, uh, in books is mm -hmm. our manifest our fear mm -hmm. of what will happen when we lose control. To mm -hmm. the point where the machine will outsmart us, and I think we already reached that point, right? There's a lot of instances where a machine has bit humans at chest, for yes. example, mm -hmm. or they have, you know, <laughs> this, like this. And I think it's this again, this thing that the black box um, thing mm -hmm. that basically you have your laptop, you understand how to use it, but you don't know how it works exactly. It's not like you can fix it if you're not a specialist on this. Mm -hmm. um, and I think like this is why we're creating all these different, again, back to dualities of us as human versus the machine, mm -hmm. uh, instead of actually being ahead of the curve and seeing, okay, this is going to happen. It's happening. How can we be in the best, uh, in the best position ourselves to deal with it? Mm -hmm. um, how can we basically um, equip ourselves in a way that would protect us. Um, 
and also i mean i don't want to be like um i don't want to i don't want to come across as a as a um, not naysayer or like or like a pessimist but mm -hmm. you know the, the human species evolves um and it has evolved you know we we didn't exist before the dinosaurs then the dinosaurs got extincted then we came around slowly i mean i'm oversimplifying things yeah, but basically sure. <laughs> we have been evo we evolved out of like the fish the fish and then we came then, then we become what we are and we're constantly evolving and we should be open to accept that maybe what the next human will be will be a hybrid between technology yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. and, and humans what like you know instead of thinking of examples like the ex machina like a bad thing maybe we should think about um uh what was it the ghost in a shell that oh, yeah. kind of example this yeah. type of like cyborg where you are a human but you're also a computer uh mm -hmm. and i mean at some points like with all of this prosthetics and um and you know the the, the prosthetic prosthetics um where where we actually recreating uh, mm -hmm. our own organs and then we add them to ourselves we are cyborgs you know okay. uh, so so i think like there's different ways to look at it mm -hmm. and that could be an evolution and maybe actually in the future the ultimate evolution will be that humans will no longer exist and that could also be fine so we can be part of like we can be part of history mm -hmm. um, i don't know if you've ever seen this but this is like this this netflix series called uh, sex and robots i think um, um i think se love sex and robots and basically they have a netflix japan something there was is, is it a series or it's a series it's an anime and basically they had an episode where uh, robots visit visited like ancient ancient human ruins and they were like oh my god look at these humans they eat <laughs> okay no yeah, I, mean, I, will, I will watch it <laughs> thanks yeah but anyway i mean in, what i'm trying to say here is that um I, I guess um with with consciousness um i think like it's something that we as you know we are we are still um struggling with our own consciousness mm -hmm. so and i think that this this understanding technology from that perspective is because we're trying to also figure out what would happen if if you know if they become if they outnumber us or outsmart us and yes. Um, I would say instead, like think of the option of becoming a hybrid or yeah. thinking of an option of embracing what's going on and just make sure that you, like, that you, that we create the circumstances mm -hmm. that, we, that we would want in order to be able to, um, to be part of this history. Yeah. Yeah. And as you said, like it, humans are evolving and all the, the evolution happens very smoothly right so we don't like notice it and right now we are already becoming in a way hybrid because we are using the, that kind of tools which are the extension of our brain right like we don't know something we we can have the access to it instantly almost exactly yeah, so I, I'm conscious of our time, so I'll just select the last two questions. <laughs> so probably, not probably, most uh, like 100% you've heard of the general uh, basic income uh, concepts. Um, do you think it's going to be a good thing? Do you think we are heading there or it's not never going to be implemented? Hmm. Yeah, that's a good question. This this conversation has been going on for quite some time now, I believe, mm -hmm. since like 2017. Um, well, uh, I cannot speak about other continents, mm -hmm. but being a European and knowing how Europeans are, I think that potentially we could have something like that here in Europe, mm -hmm. uh, that there would be something like that implemented in Europe. Um, uh, I... I mean, I don't know the works, the workings of it. I, the basic, prin excuse me, the basic principle for me, and the reason why it makes sense is because I think with all of this technology, uh, mm -hmm. and again, like going about AI, the duality of good or bad. Like I think, like AI in a way is bringing us a renaissance of, of, of the human species because we can free ourselves from a lot of the mundane daily tasks mm -hmm. and slowly with automating we actually need less time to perform tasks that would take a lot of time before mm -hmm. so i see there's two there's two different aspects to it one is that we will start working less mm -hmm. so we won't need to work uh, five days a week and there's a lot of studies also that show that 
you know, the best productivity for people would be three days a week, actually, because that's when you can really focus and then you have four days to do other stuff. Mm -hmm. um, that's yet to be tested. Um, and it on the was other tested in, in, a, in Scandinavian countries somewhere. But I think it was like four day week and they found like the results were actually promising, very promising. Yeah, perfect. Thanks for this information. So for example, oh. this is one aspect. Right? <laughs> That's one aspect, right? So basically, um, you, you know, minimizing the hours that you need to work. Mm -hmm. And um, at the same time, and I guess this is a solution mainly for, I don't know if it would be, if it would be a transitional solution or if it would be a solution generally for a long time. Mm -hmm. I think this, this is a solution that makes sense, especially for professions that they're going to be eliminated. So because of this automation, um, you basically provide this basic income and essentially with this basic income, people can still, um, they can still support themselves mm -hmm. uh, and potentially they can have more time to acquire new skills. I think one of the fears with AI is that jobs are eliminated. Mm -hmm. However, like with any kind of transition, any kind of, you know, like the industrial revolution, yeah. any kind of like new era, there, there's, there's jobs that are eliminated, but there's new jobs that are created. Mm -hmm. So what we need is to provide an infrastructure where the skills, that, where the new skills can be acquired easily. Mm -hmm. So I think like this universe, I don't know if the universal basic income would become um, possible like worldwide, whether it's going to be something that Europe will implement and whether it's going to be as a transitional phase for the people that do not have the skills that to actually be able to move towards that transition. Um, but, uh, but I, but for me, a more interesting dialogue is cutting down on hours and actually freeing people to do other stuff because now with essentially with automation, mm -hmm. you have let, you can do more work in less time, which means that, um, and, and I think what's important because of the automation and because of the new skills set that you need to acquire mm -hmm. to actually have more time to spend learning and reading Mm -hmm. and really researching so instead of spending time on mundane tasks spending time on think on thinking outside the box reading books you know and that's why i think it's also in a way a renaissance time right so in renaissance uh, that's what they did they basically were a well-rounded person where mm -hmm. they were doing a lot of different things learning from physics um, and geometry to um arts and and um and um literature so I think it's a similar thing. Yeah. yeah. Because they, did, they didn't need to <laughs> work in the field, right? Like they had support, financial support, so they could focus on, on, on learning. So maybe that's, that's the, as you said, like the repetition of, of what's, what has been in the past. Uh, okay. And the last question, uh, since you are so um, well <laughs> accomplished in creating communities, what do you think can be done or like why is it important to create resilient uh communities uh which are open for innovation and supported um this is actually something that has come for me it has come up before the before COVID 19. Mm -hmm. um, there's a podcast uh that i listened to um by some friends of mine well friends but yeah i know them for a long time um they they are Anna Kodria Radu, she's a journalist, a mm -hmm. freelance journalist who writes for a lot of different publications based out of London, mm -hmm. the New York Times being one of them, The Guardian, etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera, and then Tiffany Filippo. Um and they both have paired and they're doing this podcast called Is This Working? And uh in one of their episodes, they talked about resilience before the COVID-19. Mm -hmm. But resilience as a way to to endure and be able to continue your you know to be able to to work in uh, to, to have a career because i think that a thing again that has been noticed a lot in millennial cult culture mm -hmm. is burn the burnout rate and that the burnout is either because you overwork yourself because you have a startup mm -hmm. or you overwork yourself because you think that you should never stop being productive so resilience for me from that perspective is this concept um, that essentially uh, and they brought an expert to discuss resilience a lot um, is this co concept of um, 
of being able to uh, see your work as not a sprint, but a marathon, as something that you need to constantly do over time. And I think like that things like COVID-19 really is testing our resilience. And resilient communities has this com has part of this component. So it's about personal growth and mm -hmm. personal development and how you, you know, what kind of mindset you have, a growth mindset even to, to put it even in another scientific, um, that's another scientific uh, actually approach. Mm -hmm. um, and I can, I, I can tell you, you know about the growth mindset, right? Yes, yes. Uh, yeah. Fixed months mindset and growth mindset. So, exactly. Yeah, we can share, we can share also if you, if you have some great, uh, uh, like resources, I can share it under the, you know, in the, the exactly. YouTube. Yeah, that, that's what I was thinking that perhaps we can also share for people. Yeah, who yeah, yeah. That would be amazing. All the stuff that we're talking about. So, yeah, so, so, um, because I would like to also share that episode that I'm talking about with Azalean, with Building Resilient right. Community. Yeah. They, they brought, they brought, um, uh, they brought this, uh, this writer who writes a lot about it. So it would be interesting take. But anyway, so on one hand, um, there is, you know, how, how can you, for, for me, so resilience is on one hand, like working on your personal development and personal mm -hmm. growth. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, what we've noticed with COVID-19 is that we do not have, um, that this, we're not equipped necessarily with all the things as communities that would help us build resilience. Mm -hmm. And it's not only being resilient as a founder, which is super important, or, you know, as a, as a, in the work, in the workforce, but also being resilient to be able to overcome this sort of pandemics, to be prepared in the best way possible, and to be to be able to over to be able to overcome this. So for me, like actually for innovation, um, and one of the things that I would also be looking at personally in the next year mm -hmm. is um, when it comes to founders, how can they build resilience to mm -hmm. actually be able to. Um, survive in general because i think like when you see the when you see accelerators and you see incubators and and you notice the numbers essentially 99 percent of the companies that they are created fall mm -hmm. very fast mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and i think that a component for that is the lack of resilience yeah. is the fact that we need to build resilience to be able to be successful and in order to do that you actually have to go back to yourself and personal growth and what kind of tools you need to be that way um because it's a marathon not a sprint it's a whole life it's not like a, a year of your life yeah. so I think, I think um yeah that's why it's important and i think like right now at least when it comes to the pandemic we have um up to an extent created for us um we have some tools now that we have mm -hmm. to be able to up to an extent be be resilient for some aspects of it yeah you're right and <laughs> it's it's really important as you said to, to let the um, founders or people who are trying to do new things which haven't been done so they cannot, uh, you know, they cannot research it, they, can, they cannot refer to um, the progress, let's say. And also part of the, the problem is probably created by media, right? Because you only see the, the good stuff, the overnight successes, and, and no one tells you how many ups and downs it is and how many failures uh, you have to go through before you create something which works. Exactly, exactly. So, <laughs> you know, it's a good way, I think it's a good, it's a good way to, to end this, because um, I think resilience is definitely one of the most important things of our time now. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. Thanks, thanks so much, Alena. It was really, really great. And I hope many people will find it uh, useful as well. I did. <laughs> Hope, hope so, hope so. Yeah, thank you very much for the invitation and um, for having this, this outlet for people to talk about this type of topics. Yeah, uh, thanks so much. So I will share the, the resources you will send me. Yes, exactly. I will provide the resources and you can share awesome. them under. Thanks so Perfect. much. And have a lovely Sunday. You too. Bye. <laughs> <laughs>